in this second lecture, I will briefly go over the fundamentals of database search. Um, who in the room has never done a proteomics database search by themselves? Does it count if you try to and it just never works? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, that gives me some idea. So the fundamental concept is actually a very straightforward. So you know database searches from genomics, transcriptomics, you use BLAST or whatever. Um, you have a query sequence and you try to find it in a larger database. Um, fundamentally, that is also what we do in a peptide database search. You will see that um, it is based on a different query that you run. Um, but Similar to sequence search, it also has a scoring function. It, it has to be run against the database. We'll see what that is. Um, and there are different tools, just like uh, you can have different search engines for genomic sequences. There are dozens of database search tools for proteomics, and um, you can sort of pick one of those. Um, they are all working reasonably well. Uh, I'll talk briefly about some differences later on. So let's look at peptide database search. And the first thing I, I would like to point out is that I'm talking about peptide database search. I'm not talking about protein database search because even though we call it proteomics, we're actually not searching for the whole proteins. Instead, as I said earlier, we digest the proteins. We have triptych peptides, and that is what we measure, and that's also what we what we search. So how can you identify a peptide? Now, if you're a mass spec person, uh, if you have been in a lab, you know what peptides do. We, we've seen earlier that peptides are linear polymers. And in a mass spec, you can measure the mass of those guys. Then you know it's like 527.3 Dalton or whatever it is. But that's not going to tell you the sequence of the whole thing. What you can then do in a mass spec is so-called tandem MS. You basically bombard your peptides um, that are trapped with, an, with a neutral gas, and it's going to break. It's going to break into fragments. And sort of the neat thing about that is it is preferentially going to break between amino acids. So it's not going to break at arbitrary positions, but it's going to break at the weakest in, at the weakest position, and that is usually the peptide bond. So what happens is you can record a second spectrum, a so-called MS2 or tandem spectrum. And this spectrum contains information about the sequence. So if you break such a peptide, you basically get what's called a prefix ion and a suffix ion. And they have distinct masses. Sometimes the, the charge is going to be on the left-hand side, sometimes on the right-hand side. And depending on that, you get different types of ions. I'll show you the nomenclature in a minute. For, for now, just bear with me. So you get the spectrum. And the trick now is that if it breaks here, and then it breaks there, and it breaks there, you get different ions. And they are apart by an amino acid mass. Yeah, because if you break this glutamate off, then the difference between those ions is going to be the mass of that amino acid. So fundamentally, if you have such a complete spectrum of a peptide, you can just sit down with your pocket calculator, and you can look at the distances between those peaks, and you can try to con reconstruct or infer the sequence. You can do that manually. You can do that with computer algorithms, and it's called de novo sequencing. Note that this is not a database search, but that's a different type of algorithm that we won't discuss here. The problem, however, is that this fragmentation is often incomplete. So rather than having fragments for each of these amino acids, for each of these peptide bonds, you tend to have only a subset. So you tend to have a peak here and a peak there, but never the complete thing. And the idea of database search now is, well, even if we don't know the full thing, we have some partial information on which amino acids should be in there and what their dif differences are. And we can look in a database that contains all the protein sequences 
and try to match these peaks against the sequence. So rather than searching a sequence against the sequence database, we now search a spectrum against the sequence database. So a slightly different idea. Now let's look at this fragmentation process. So here you see um, a peptide backbone. You have one uh, side chain here, side chain there, M, M plus one. And fundamentally, it can break here in the middle of the peptide bond, but uh, less frequently, it can also break to the left and to the right. These are basically the backbone bonds, and there's a nomenclature for that. So people call that A, B, C, or X, Y, and Z ions. And for every B ion, there's a corresponding Y ion. One, the, the B ion is a prefix ion. The Y ion is a corresponding suffix ion. And the same goes for A and X and C and Z. It depends a bit on the fragmentation type. ETD, for example, produces uh, a, a different ion types or different ratios of these ion types than CID. So it depends on your experimental sets. So this nomenclature has been around for a while. People talk about B and Y ion series a lot. And the trick really with database search is that if you know the sequence, you can predict, of course, the masses of these B and Y ions. So you can construct or predict a theoretical spectrum. And I've drawn it here. This would be a theoretical a spectrum that cont contains only the Y ions of such a peptide. So how do we compute that? Well, you can actually write, you can do that in a simple script. It's like 10 lines of Python if you have a table with the amino acid masses, because all you have to do is you walk over the sequence and you sum up the masses up to a certain point in that sequence. Note that, oops, that I don't have intensities here. While it's easy to pre predict the masses of these peaks, it's very hard to predict the relative peak heights. So these theoretical spectra have all unit intensities normally. Again, there are some exceptions. So, of course, if you have the Y ions, you also have the corresponding B ions. Um, so you can add some more peaks to that. You can also have doubly charged B ions and Y ions, depending on the charge of the peptides. You can have so-called neutral losses um, that happens um, in the mass spec. You lose, for example, water or ammonia, and then the peak shifts by, by 18 or 17 Dalton. Uh, or you can lose phosphoric acid. So there are many things that can happen. And what you need to do is you need to construct a model that takes that into account. So that actually takes for an arbitrary string a set of rules. These rules are being applied to construct a theoretical spectrum for this particular peptide. Now, when we do proteomics, we usually digest the proteins using trypsin. And that is something imp important in this respect as well, because it's, uh, it means that we can narrow down the peptides that we want to look at drastically. We assume that all the triptych peptides could be in our sample, could be in our database. So you do a so-called in silico digest. You take the whole proteome that you downloaded, say, from NCBI, and your database search tool does an in silico digest. It just looks at where are the uh, where where do the patterns for trypsin match? So K and R, but not prolin, and it cuts up these peptides and constructs an internal database, internal representation of all triptych peptides. And for each of these triptych pep peptides, it can then construct these theoretical spectra. So, at the heart, all of these of the algorithms, all of these database search engines do the following. They take the tandem spectra from such an LCMS experiment, these are tandem spectra, and basically they discard, in the first round, they usually discard the intensities, and they just store the M over Z values. So the spectrum is really a list of M over Z values in the scoring. Sometimes intensity comes back in, and then there's some filtering going on. Some search engines keep only up to 200 peaks, you can do noise filtering. So there's all sorts of magic going on that I won't get into, but fundamentally they reduce the spectra to a list of mass to charge ratios. 
They take a sequence database, huge FASTA file that contains all the proteins. They do this in silico digest to obtain the triptych peptides. And for these triptych peptides, they construct these theoretical spectra. And again, the theoretical spectra are just lists of M over Zs. And now the whole database engine, all it has to do is it has to compare all of these theoretical spectra to all the experimental spectra. And it's going to produce a list of, of hits or PSMs, peptide spectrum matches. And it, it's going to sort them by score. So typically this search engine is going to report something for each spectrum. And that's sort of the dangerous part about that. You will always find something. There are a few exceptions. If your database is too small, they're, they're, again, what I'm saying are pretty general things. But uh, the idea is now, if your spectrum was good and if your database contained this spectrum, then the top ranking hit is most likely the peptide you're really looking for. The question now is, um, is 18.77 a good hit or not? And the answer is, I don't know. It depends. It depends on your search engine. It depends on the score. We will look into that um, a bit more closely. So let's go through these steps. <coughs> so first of all, we need to extract all the sequence candidates. That's done by looking at the, uh, um, at the sequence database. Now, if you know that your spectrum um, that your peptide has a certain mass, then you need to look only at, at a small fraction of the whole sequence database. Uh, because you can pretty quickly narrow it down to the parent mass of your peptide. Does everyone know what the parent mass is? Okay. Uh, so if you, before you fragment the peptide, you select a very, very narrow window of potential ions that are being fragmented. So you have a rough idea of the mass of this particular peptide. And uh, all the others you don't need to look at. So as a matter of fact, even if you have a large proteome database, the number of candidates that the search engine has to score is usually in the hundreds. It's not more than that. So you really compute the difference of your precursor mass and the candidate. And if that is below this threshold, precursor mass threshold, we'll get back to that. Then you get a set of all these candidate spectra. For each of these candidate sequences, you now construct the theoretical spectrum. And you compare that to your experimental spectrum. And that means you look at the spectra and compute a score. Now there are different ways to do that and I'll talk you through the way of how to, the scoring is done. Fundamentally you can ask how many of these peaks are shared. So how often is a peak that occurs in the theoretical spectrum also present in the experimental spectrum? In an ideal world where the peptides fragments completely, where you have little noise in the spectrum, you would be able to see that all the, spect all the peaks in your theoretical spectra are also present in the experimental spectrum. And that would, should give a high score, so you can do simple things like um, a dot product. Yeah, you can simply compute the dot product between the vector representations of the two spectra. Or you can do something, some search engines use something like shared peak count. Yeah, you just look, are the peaks within a certain deviation? And if yes, you, if so, you just count them as shared peaks. You can, of course, do intensity weighting on that and so on and so on. In reality, these search engines are a bit more complicated. They are, um, they are um, lots of experimental parameters that you have to take into account. There are things like contaminants. There are some things you just don't want to see. There is the so-called crap home. Um, 
can I Google that? It's it's a word you can download the crap home. These are frequent contaminants. What do you, what would you expect as a contaminant in proteomics? Keratin. Keratin. Yeah, where does it come from? Well, yeah, metabolites you wouldn't have many. But one of the things is of course trypsin. Yes. Trypsin yeah. autodigest is it's still there, yeah. So there are some things that you can expect to be in the sample without them being re biologically relevant. Yeah? So some of these things you need to remove. Um, you have components for this in silico digestion that can be more complicated than what I just described. You can do that for different enzymes. You can apply different rules to do that. Um, and of course, um, the, the scoring down here, that is something that changes between search engines as well. So let's look at search engines. As I said, there are dozens of these search engines around. Um, they all differ with respect to spectrum preprocessing. Some discard low intensity peaks. Some have a fixed number of, of peaks that they keep around. Um, some do post or preprocessing, um, different score statistics, and of course, they differ in speed. Um, if you run a search on a very large data set that can take a couple of days, and then you will actually start noticing difference be differences between these search engines. I'd like to go briefly into the internals of one search engine that I like to describe because we actually know what it's doing, um, which is not the case for Mascot or Sequest. There have been papers on that, but that was like 15, 20 years ago, and you can be pretty sure that that is not what's going on under the hood anymore, uh, or people know that, but there has never been an update. So we really don't know what these algorithms do. You can try to infer it. Um, people have tried to look at the scores and see what happens, reverse engineer that. But fundamentally, we don't know. Um, with X tandem, we can look into the source code, uh, and we have pretty decent description of what it really does. And I'll try to give you a rough outline so that you see what's really happening under the hood, because that's going to help in understanding the parameters, and it's going to help in interpreting the, the results of these search engines. So. Um, the scoring is actually fairly simple. It uh, has a, a simple idea behind that, that it is this dot product. So you compare the experimental spectrum and the theoretical spectrum. And the dot product score is then just the product of the intensities in the uh, experimental spectrum and a binary, binary variable in the theoretical spectrum. So if the peak is in the theoretical spectrum, then the intensity of the peak in the experimental spectrum is counted towards the overall score. Now, there are a few things to be noted about this score. Um, obviously, this score can achieve arbitrary magnitude, depending on the intensities of your peaks. It can be somewhere between 0 and, and infinity. That's not so great when it comes to a score. Of course, you can normalize, and then that's what people have done. The other thing is, um, the more peaks you have in your experimental spectrum, the higher your score usually gets, you know, because you can start hitting, also by random, some of these peaks. So for all practical purposes, this dot product score is not very useful. So as with all search engines, we need to think about how to transform these raw scores into something useful. But remember, that's the same for pairwise alignment. If you compute Smith-Waterman alignment, then the raw score is not going to be all that meaningful, because it's mainly telling you how long your query sequence was. So in the same way, we need to transform um, these scores. So this here is a frequency histogram of an arbitrary random variable. So you just count how often does something occur. And you can do the same for the dot product score. So you run this not just on one spectrum, and that's something to keep in mind. It's going to be context specific again. You run it on a large data set. You've got 10,000 spectra, 15,000 spectra. Once you do that, you look at the distribution of your scores. Some scores will be frequent, others will be infrequent. And you can use that to normalize. So 
what you can do is you can look at this distribution and ask the question what's the probability that you see a score greater than a certain value x yeah. and that's basically um, by summing up over this over this distribution so you would hope that if your score is large then you have found a good hit uh, a score that doesn't fulfill this basic requirement is probably crap uh, but you just don't know where to draw the line where 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 do you believe these scores so the way x tandem does that is by looking at this distribution and i for brevity i skip skip a few slides um, but basically you, you ask the question how likely is it that I found something of a score of 30 or above by random now what you get is always a list of hits so not just one hit but you actually get plenty of hits those you can put in there and this is the distribution that you get for this hyper score um, and you would hope that this hit here is correct now, what are you going to do with that? So one of, the one, one of the things you can do is you can take the log of these matches and convert the scores you have into an expectation value. And this is basically what x tandem does. It takes a log of the number of matches, and then you can extrapolate and look at the position where your hit is. What would you expect? in terms of this score. How likely is it that you get this score just by random? And in this case, you would see, well, that is rather unlikely. Yeah, but a score, say, of 20 here, that is something that can occur quite frequently. And in this way, you can convert that into something that is akin to probability. You would say, most likely, you have a 10% chance of this occurring at random and this is a way of normalizing these scores it's not the best way we will see later on that there are better statistical ways to deal with that but it is something that's already built into the search engine if it runs on a large enough data set so what other search engines are out there um, most of you have heard of mascot and there's also sequest there's Phoenix, there's Inspect, there's Mirimatch. Um, basically, there are like three, four, five search engines every every month that are being published. I think um, it is actually very hard to keep track of them. Um, the problem with the commercial ones is again we don't really know what's going on. Um, they tend to have fancier interfaces, but um, they tend to have pretty steep prices. So for many of the core facilities, if you or if you want to reproduce large-scale data, it can be prohibitively expensive because they basically have CPU-based licenses. When you look at comparisons, and there are dozens of review papers who compare these search engines, you will actually notice that the differences are not that great. You will probably not find two labs that have exactly the same belief as to which search engine is the best one. When you ask them why did you pick this particular search engine, it's mostly for very mundane reasons. Because it was installed already, because we had the license, um, because the lab I was before, they used that. Um, when we try that, and we try that a lot, really the difference are plus minus 10%. Um, differences in speed can be larger. You will also see that it depends on, on the instrument, on some instruments, or on some data sets even. One of these search engines works really well, on the others it doesn't. Um, I cannot really give you a good tip. The only thing that um, works well is just running several of them and, and compare the outcome. It also depends on what you want to find, yes. So how many search engines are there? Um, 
OpenMS has a, has a fairly simple model. We try to wrap existing search engines. We have some internal ones, but I don't actually don't recommend using them because they're for, for very specific reasons. Um, but we basically have wrappers around these search engines here that are on the slide, and there are a couple more by now. There's Comet, there is um, MSGF Plus, um, there's OMSA, yeah. So, 10, 8, something like that. Are the slides in the right? Oh, yes. Okay. I'll put them up tonight. I didn't. Um, I'll send around the, the link once it's Great. there online. Um, so, what do you need to know about these search engines if you want to compare them? Well, all of, th all of them have parameters. And now, the nice part about that is that, that OpenMS tries to abstract them for you in a way, because each of these search en engines has their own parameter file format and in which you need to specify them. Basically what OpenMS, what the wrapper does is it takes the parameters that, that the search engine needs. Um, you have a, an interface in line with which you can specify that or to, you can use the any file editor to, to do that. That's another OpenMS application. And these need to be tied to the particular instrument that you're working with. Because you need to know a few basic things like what is the precursor mass tolerance that was chosen in the experiment. You need to know what, um, where fixed or variable modifications are. I'll get back to that in a second. And once you have these parameters, then they, then they are translated to the parameters of this particular search engine. And this way you get some sort of um, transferability of parameters. Note that there are some parameters that are very specific to a search engine, which we cannot model easily in that way. So you have to fiddle around a bit with it uh, in some cases. So what are the parameters that matter? So mass tolerance is, of course, one that is essential. Um, once you know the, the instrument, it's kind of easy to estimate that. Um, this precursor, mass, uh, precursor tolerance is essential because it determines the search space. Basically tells us what are the what are the peptides that should be included as candidates in the search. And if you open up this window, of course, then your search space is going to explode and you will find all sorts of interesting things. Uh, it's just not going to be the right peptide. Of course, um, we also need to know the accuracy on the tandem spectrum, so tandem MS side because you can have lower, high-resolution spectra, and the search engine needs to know how accurate these masses are that it compares them against. Then you need to have some idea of the charge state. So usually the mass specs are set to only fragment ions uh, that have a charge greater than 1. Plus 2, plus 3 is typically what you do. Um, or plus 4, and that again depends on on your sample, if you have some idea that you expect longer peptides for whatever reason, you might have higher charges. Um, another thing that uh, people look at occasionally are miscleavages. Miscleavages are peptides where one of the one of these triptic sites was not cleaved by the enzyme, so you have an incomplete digestion. If you want to find those guys, um, then you need to tell the search engines to look at them because they need to be generated as candidate peptides. Um, the same goes for semi-triptic peptides. Um, then there are modifications. And here it's essential that you actually know what happened in the lab. If you don't know what happened in the lab, you can create lots of interesting results that are completely pointless. So what usually happens is that you do carbamethylation of the cysteines as a fixed modification. Um, reductive alkylation, um, and that of course shifts the masses of all the cysteines. And if your search engine doesn't know about that, then it will just look for the wrong mass. So that is something that, that happens. Um, it's usually done with uh, uroacetamide and is then assumed to be a fixed modification. Now, fixed modification means that you shift all the cysteines. So the search space actually remains the same. And you just change the mass of them. Very different 
are variable modifications. With variable modifications, you assume that the modification can be there or not. So a typical example of that would be phosphorylation, where you say either there is a phosph uh, 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 phosphorylation on the serine threonine, for example, or it can also be missing. And the search engine now needs to generate all the candidates, in one case with, in the other without the modification. And that, of course, leads to a large expansion of the search space, because you have to enumerate all the combinatorial possibilities of these variable modifications. So you could assume that if you increase the number of variable modifications, you can also find more stuff, because you permit all these modified peptides. Um, unfortunately, if you permit all these modifications, if you tell the search engines, include all these different possibilities of how these peptides can be modified, then the number of your identifications actually goes down. So intuitively, you would argue, if I include all these modifications, if I include, increase the search space, I should find more stuff. And that is true. But what you should not forget, and we will talk about the statistics of that, this is only true if you assume you don't care about the reliability of the identification. But what really happens is that you in increase the search space by so much more than you increase the number of potential candidates that are in your sample that you find a lot less if you include these variable modifications. In some cases, you have to do that. If you do phosphoproteomics, obviously, you need to have uh, phosphorylation as a variable modification. And I, I show you in the talk later today how we can deal with the statistics of that and how to keep the number manageable. It's just something to keep in mind. You know, if you look at search engines, do not randomly include variable modifications that you don't need. Uh, you will not like the results of that. Yes. <coughs> Um, so oxy um, depends on, on, on how much oxidation you really have, but generally, yeah, you can include that as a, as a variable modification. It's usually the oxy, it's not quant quantitatively oxidized. Other questions? That's an excellent question. Um, what you've seen from the algorithm is that the algorithm can only find stuff that you know. And that's why what they say is the post genomics is normal. Um, because stuff that is not in the genome or is incorrectly annotated will not be found. And one example where that can hurt you is if you're looking at protein like genomes. Because there are no SNPs in the reference genomes. So you will not be able to find um, peptides or proteins that have a large number of, of, of SNPs in them. Or that can hurt you if you do two more proteomics, where you have a large number of mutations. Often that is the interesting stuff, and you will not find that if you have not sequenced the genome of a particular thing. And that's just something to keep in mind. You can do metaproteomics, and um, one of the things to do there is obviously to always have also metagenome parallel, so that you can actually match it on, on specific samples. Uh, because doing that on a large scale against a database is not going to fly. It's just not going to work. Um, so this is one problem. 
So, assertion is that in which is greater, it's never the right. Why is that? Because um, obviously you saw how the scores are computed. So, we need enough statistics for that. We need enough background to actually get to that score. And if you have only one protein in there, then it's, it's pretty obvious what the search engine is going to do. It's going to compare all the spectra, and it's only going to see that through the the lens of this particular protein and everything that everything that might be something completely different is going to look like it's attacking this particular protein because it's the only thing it can afford. And that is sort of a, a bit of a trap with these database searches because they assume that you know the entire proteome that can be in there. And it's not going to look left or right. No, only the stuff that is really there. And that means that um, in most cases, you will have plenty of peptides that will remain unidentified. Because in reality, as we discussed that already, proteins can be more complex than that. There are modifications, there's speculation going on, different slide variants that are not included in the database, and you will not find them. Okay. Then let's find some proteins. So we just resumed the tutorial. Who, so who started with the idea?